It has been 50 years since the Mahanirvana of Bhagwan Sri Raman Maharshi. I had the rare good fortune of being present on the night of April 14, 1950, when a brilliant star slowly sailed across the sky at the very moment the Maharshi took his last mortal breath. Even more than this, my destiny has been uniquely connected to the Maharshi from my birth. My father, Naga Sundaram Ayer, was the younger brother of Sri Bhagwan. Not long after I was born, my mother passed away. And when I was three years old, my father took sannyas and joined Sri Bhagwan and their mother, Aragamma at Skandashramam. I was then lovingly raised by Bhagwan's sister Alamelu and her husband Sri Pichu Ayer. Since they had no children of their own and none of my father's brothers had any issues, I became the only remaining descendant in my family's line. As a child, I was brought to Tiruvannamalai two or three times each year to see Bhagwan, my father and grandmother Alagamma when she was still living. Sometimes I was left in the care of Bhagwan and stayed overnight in the ashram. Like a mother, he would put me to sleep at night and then wake and wash me in the morning. My life flowed on smoothly. I was married in 1929. All my seven children were brought to Bhagwan soon after their birth and he was pleased to bless them by giving them their names. With Sri Bhagwan's consent and blessings, I was requested in 1938 to move to Tiruvannamalai and assist my father, Sri Niranjananda Swami, in managing the ashram. After my father was absorbed in Sri Bhagwan in 1953, I succeeded him as the ashram manager and president. In all humility, I can say that Bhagwan has showered on me incredible grace and blessings from my birth to this very day. In 1984, my wife Nagalakshmi attained the holy feet of Sri Bhagwan. I continued serving in the ashram until 1994, at which time I resigned, handed over the presidentship of the ashram to my eldest son, Sri V.S. Ramanan, and took the vows of sannyas. I now live a quiet life in the ashram, remembering the holy presence of the Master and thanking him for his innumerable blessings on me and all his devotees the world over. After the Maharshi's Mahanirvana, we published many reminiscences about Bhagwan, written by devotees who moved closely with him. These books are a valuable testimony to the ever-present divine personality of the Master. What you are now about to see is yet another testimony to the living presence of Sri Ramana Maharshi. You will hear from the lips of those who had the wonderful privilege of living under the watchful, loving eye of Sri Maharshi, who was perhaps the greatest sage of the 20th century. I have known these devotees since I came here in 1938. We were like one family, and Bhagwan was our father, mother, are everything. He continues to attract sincere devotees to him 
from all over the world as he lives not only in Sri Ramanashramam but in the hearts of all. of September 1940 and I last met him in the first week of April 1950, a week before his death. During my first visit, a great man, Sir P. S. Yuswami Iyer, a wonderful great man, I told him I was going. He said, don't go alone. Take somebody whom you like, to whom you are attached, take them in. And so I took one old student, Subramanian, one then student is my and my wife. <coughs> so I went to this group of people. And for this, Shiva Swami here is responsible. He told me he used to walk on Uttagaman, Nilgiri Hills. There's a place called Dodapetka, which is a steep precipice. From there, you can look into the abyss about 8,000 feet below. People like to look into it. Look down and in order not to fall, becoming giddy, they used to tie themselves up with a piece of rope, somebody will hold the rope and then you can look down. So he gave me this analogy and said, when you go to Bhagawan, you will be swept off your feet, you will fall into the abyss. I see. And so be bound by attachment to some people. Oh. So I had three ropes, my wife, my students, they were fine people, all of them were very good people. Many people went to him because they wanted their wishes fulfilled. Many people went to him because in their reflection they found consolation from him. Many people went to him with intellectual problems which he solved. So many, there, there are many, shall I say, demands on him and he met them mostly. So far as I am concerned, I went because, see, 1927, I had heard of him, I read about him. Kavya Ganta came and spoke, spoke in my college. So I heard about Bhagavan. And many people have written to me. But that, at that time I was a fool. And I said, what is this man sitting on top of a hill and doing nothing? Here is Gandhi. Then in 1939-40, I passed through a series of very interesting experiences. One was, I read the poems of Bhagavan. I know something about poetry. Mm -hmm. English term, poetry is poetry. Poetry is the bridge between the, the, the actual phenomenon and the ultimate real. Now, when I read Burunana's poems, I said, good heavens, the, the man who inspired this, this kind of poetry is divine. Number one, that moved me completely. Burunana completely converted me. Next thing that happened was that uh, I had a very terrible domestic problem. Your uh, niece of mine had broken away from my husband and various things happened with him. Good people, all good people. And I did not know what to do. I didn't want them to quarrel. They're both good people, but they parted, they married again. That's another story. You take it casually in America, we don't. So this thing happened. Then various things of the... Ah, most important of all, I used to spend vacations in Bangalore. Now during that vacation, that is April, 1940, a famous Pandit, Sanskrit Pandit, great Sanskrit Pandit, systematically taught me the Brahma Sutras. Then I could see that behind this apparent laziness of Bhagwan was something very profound. And that man said, this is not pure theory. You go through Namale, you see the man. So when a brigade scholar told me, 
Another very interesting thing was, you must have heard about Douglas Ainsley. Douglas Ainsley. He came to Madras. I was in Presidency College. I took him around because I'm, I myself a great admirer of Dante and Croce, Benedetto Bener, Croce, mm -hmm. philosophy of the aesthetic, practical history. Mm -hmm. he, he was a great favorite of mine. And uh, he knew Croce personally and his translator. And so after I spent a week with him, taking him to various places and so on, uh, he casually asked me, uh, have you seen Nevada Marshi? Now here is it, an Englishman steeped in uh, uh, Italian philosophy telling me about Nevada So I said, I'm, I should be ashamed, I was ashamed. Mm -hmm. Then I reported, as you saw me, I'd like to go. Mm -hmm. He said, don't go by yourself, tie yourself in many bonds. Then I did, I'm, I'm still tied up. Mm -hmm. I, I have the courage to run away from her, mm -hmm. you see. <laughs> many people tell you, go to, go to the Himalayas. Bhagwan is here. So all these things, so to say, compelled me. And all my problems are solved in five minutes. As I say again and again, in his presence, I felt like a little baby in its mother's lap. How to explain this? At a very young age, when I was around 18 years old, Bhagavan appeared to me in a dream. In the dream, I saw this hill and Bhagavan walking towards me. I could even see a Shivalinga in the dream. Before this, Krishna used to appear in my dreams frequently. But here was a person I had never seen before. I was captivated by him. Our family deity was Vishnu and we used to offer puja to Vishnu and Krishna. However, seeing a Shivalinga in the dream puzzled me. At that age, I could not comprehend the dream. Right from then onwards, my mind changed. Having been a coward since childhood, I would not even walk to the veranda of my house at night. But after having obtained the darshan of Bhagavan in my dream, the fear that had gripped me left me. It was only at the age of 20 that I got a book on Bhagavan. It was the Ramana Vijayam, written by Sudhananda Bharati. At the mere touch of the book, I lost body consciousness. My whole body became numb. And it was with great difficulty that I managed to come back and sit next to my friend. Noticing my plight, she commented, you should not read all sorts of books. Your family members would be cross with you. You don't need to read such books at your young age. A little bit of reading may be fine, but not spending all 24 hours with such books. Those days, I would spend all my time reading spiritual books like Jnana Vasishta, Bhagavad Gita, etc. I curiously opened Ramana Vijayam for the first time. As soon as I did so, I saw a picture of the young Bhagavan. I fell down 
on the impact of seeing the picture. What book is this? I wondered. Don't read this book. I think this book will change your life. My friend warned me. I saw her off and took the book to bed with me. I was afraid that I would swoon again. So I lay down on the bed to read the book. As I read the book, I was so absorbed that I didn't feel my goosebumps. My eyes kept closing involuntarily. I later understood that this was meditation as prescribed in Bhagavan's path. In my family, women were not allowed to leave the house, not to mention leaving the town. However, after reading Ramana Vijaya, I felt I should meet Ramana Maharshi before giving up this body, whatever the consequences. The book provided me with this vairagya, but I could not leave home immediately and it was two years before I was successful. I left home stealthily with my brother's help. He is also a spiritual person and is a sadhu now. I reached Thiruvannamalai with the help of a servant. Having reached there, I was filled with guilt for having run away from home and remorse for having done a wrong thing in order to achieve good ends. I wished I had been born in some other family. I felt very depressed. I came to Bhagavan Sanadi outside the old hall. Omundo Adediyar was seated among the audience at that time. I had gone to the office to inquire about Bhagavan and was told that he was near the well. When I came to the well, I could not see Bhagavan, only a flame of fire. I asked for directions to go to Bhagavan and they have sent me to a sacrificial place, I said to myself. As I stood there, Bhagavan appeared at that very spot. I thought I had this delusion of seeing fire instead of Bhagavan because I had come in from the hot sun. It was only later that I realized that Bhagavan had given me Jyoti Darshana. I could feel the Spurana in my heart. Bhagavan said, You have come home. Sit down. I sat down in front of him, but did not ask him anything. There were so many people around, and I was not used to it. I had no idea what to ask him anyway. Not. I spent three days sitting in front of Bhagavan. However, the feeling of guilt of running away from home continued to haunt me. One day, Bhagavan narrated his story to Omanda Rediyar. I ran away from home too. I was afraid that somebody might catch hold of me and take me back home. I was running away like a thief. If it was so difficult for me, how much more difficult would it be for a woman? These words of Bhagavan wiped out my sense of guilt completely. Those words of Bhagavan also removed any residual fear in me entirely. Since then, I have gone round the hill alone several times, even at night. I would go without telling anybody. There was no fear. If I had fear, how could I have stayed here alone? About my running away, Bhagavan said, What about it? That may be needed. I was 16 when I came here. Moreover, she is a young girl. That is how one must do it if need be. What's wrong about it? At the time of Bhagavan's Maha Nirvana, I was at Rajapalyam. That night, at the same time, I saw a beautiful blue light going up in the sky and I knew Bhagavan had left the body. I did not want to live after that and so I started to fast, hoping to drop the body that way.
For five or six days, I did not touch food. But during the time, I had several visions, and in one of them, I was taken inside a cave on the hill and saw rishis performing yajnas. Sri Bhagavan was seated there. Bhagavan said, Why are you crying? Why this anguish? You say that I have gone away, but where have I gone? I am here. Can you not see me? Some rishis brought some prasad to Bhagavan. Sri Bhagavan took some and gave it to me. I did not remember in the dream that I was fasting. So I ate the prasad given to me by Bhagavan. For five days afterwards, the smell of the prasad was with me. Now, was that a dream or reality? I consider it to be Bhagavan's grace. The morning after the dream, I started taking food and coffee. My brother and sister were also fasting with me, deciding to give up their bodies if I were to give up mine. From that day onwards, I had no thought at all that Bhagavan had left us. He is all-pervading. I felt no more sorrow in my heart. He is here too. See how we all are gathered here? What have we done to deserve this? The next day, we had a meeting with Bhagavan. Just then Bhagavan had arrived in the present premises ashram, where there are no buildings at all. There is only a shed covering the samadhi of Mother. Bhagavan was seated on a bench under a tree, under the shade of a tree. He had the dog Ross, Rose lying on that bench. He was simply stroking the dog. I wondered, among us Brahmins, the dog is an animal whose touch will defile the purity. I, a good part of my respect for the Maharshi was gone when I saw him touching that unclean animal. For, for all its cleanliness and neatness, it was unclean from the Brahmin point of view. I had another question. I was then an agnostic. I said, Nature can take care of itself. Where is the need for a creator? What is the fun of writing 
all these books telling cock and bull stories which do not change the search of reason. I wanted to put in straight question whether there is a soul, whether there is a God, whether there is a salvation. All these three questions are included in one question. Well, sir, you are sitting there like this. You are, you are sitting like this. I can see your present condition. What is your next city? The word in Sanskrit city means the state or condition. What is your future state? In Sanskrit, it means sta tit to stand. That is the posture, the stand to stand. Maharshi did not answer the question. Oh, oh, you are taking shelter under this glum, indifferent silence from answering an inconvenient question. The thought flashed in my mind. Simultaneously, I felt as if I had a bomb exploding under my seat. The Maharshi exploded, Stiti, what do you mean? What do you mean by Stiti? I was not prepared for that question. Oh, oh, this man is very dangerous. He is dangerously alive. And he answered un with proper care. So I said, if I ask him about the body, it's a useless question. The body may be burnt or buried. What he wanted to ask him about is the condition of something within the body. Of course, I can recognize a mind inside of me. Well, I was out to say about the mind. But if he puts the question, what is mind? I'm not prepared to answer. All these were passing across my mind. I as I was looking at him, he was looking with a fierce look. I question, what is mind? Of course, mind is made of thoughts. What are thoughts? I landed in a void. No answer. I could not present a question about a mind which did not exist. The mind was a thing that existed for me. I found it does not exist. I was bewildered. I simply sat like a statue. Two pairs of eyes were gripping each other. The eyes of the Maharshi and my eyes are getting in a tight embrace. I had no sense of body. Nothing except those two pairs of eyes. Except a pair of eyes. I don't know how long it continues. When I came to myself, I was terribly afraid of the man. This is a dangerous man. In spite of myself, I prostrated and got away from his company. That look was not unfamiliar to me. That was the book, look which the Marti gave in my 14th year. <laughs>
This incident took place after Bhagavan had moved to the new hall. During those days, the front row closest to Bhagavan was reserved for the important people. Although Bhagavan did not know about it, there was a specific unspoken seating arrangement and others who occupied those places would be even be asked to go and sit elsewhere. On this day, the front row was empty. Rani Majumdar and myself were sitting by the window at the end of the hall. Rani suggested that the two of us could sit there close to Bhagavan. I agreed. The front row would begin at the pillars closest to Bhagavan's couch. No one could sit right beside the couch in order to give people room to move about. On seeing the two of us, a Telugu lady called Kame Suramma also came and sat next to us in the front row. The three of us were directly facing Bhagavan. As soon as we had settled there, Bhagavan began looking directly at me. Unable to bear the intensity of his direct look, I immediately closed my eyes. How long I remained like that, I do not know. But some time later, I opened my eyes and found Bhagavan seated motionless, looking at me just as before. I closed my eyes again. Some time later, Mauni Srinivasa Rao came with the day's tapal. Hearing Bhagavan talk to him, I opened my eyes. However, I was still in the same state that I was in when my eyes were closed and didn't really register anything that was happening. After attending to the tapal, Bhagavan got up to leave for the Goshala. I got up along with everybody else, but again, without any real awareness of my surroundings. Kame Surama, who was sitting next to me, hugged me and said, Kanakamma, you are extremely fortunate. Ever since you sat there, Bhagavan has continuously been looking directly at you until Mauni got the tapal. You have got everything. Bhagavan has given you all that you need. So saying, she hugged me close to her. But I was in no state to give a reply. I just told her, tears are streaming down my eyes. I don't know what to say. The waves of peace coming over me kept me from talking. I came from Tondanguruchi, where I had a stall to distribute water to the needy. One day, a sadhu came and gave me Bhagavan's Upadesa Saram and a photograph of Bhagavan. I saw Bhagavan's picture and was instantaneously captivated. 
I decided that I must see Bhagawan immediately. I hastened to Tiruvannamalai the very same night and have never gone back. It happened to be a full moon night. When I arrived at Tiruvannamalai, I chanced to meet Seshadri Swami at a corner of the Rettai Pilayar Koyal close to the big temple and received his blessings. I then went to Sri Bhagavan. When I came to the ashram, there was just a shed over the mother's shrine and Bhagavan was seated there. One day, after completing the construction of the ashram dispensary, I was feeling tired and was reclining against a wall of the dining hall. Bhagawan came up to me and said, I'm afraid to even look at you. I asked him why that should be so. He said, if I would just look in one direction, you would construct a structure there. This was of course in jest, but it also meant that I could understand Bhagawan's subtle instructions and follow them meticulously. This was great appreciation showered upon me by Sri Bhagawan. Once I was about to construct some steps when Bhagawan gave me a beating. I was asked to repair some steps behind the dining hall. In those days, money and materials were scarce. I asked Ramaswamy Pillai to get three or four measures of cement. Now, in Tamil, the word padi stands for both measure as well as for steps. Bhagavan asked me how many padis, meaning how many steps I was constructing. I thought he wanted to know how many measures of cement I was ordering. Bhagavan gave me a playful slap and said, I'm asking about one padi and you're answering about another. On another occasion, I was cementing the surface below the water tap to be used to clean vessels. Bhagavan was sitting next to me, giving me instructions. As I got up, I banged my head hard against the tap. Bhagavan asked Madhava Swami to bring Zamba and personally massage my head for a long time. Though I had pain in my head, I kept reminding myself of Bhagavan's teaching, which was to give up the I am the body idea. I also thank the tap for giving me this opportunity to receive a massage from the golden hands of Sri Bhagavan. It is said in Akshramana Male, unless thou extends thy hand of grace and embrace me, I am lost. Have mercy on me, O Arunachala, or graciously enfold me body to body, limb to limb, or I am lost, O Arunachala. In the earlier days, Madhava Swami, Rangaswami Subramanyam and I used to massage the sole of Bhagwan's feet with oil at night and put our heads against his feet to receive his grace after completing the massage. Bhagwan used to pretend to be asleep when we did this. However, when large crowds started coming to the ashram regularly, we had to stop this practice of ours. When we tried to massage him, Bhagwan would say that if I did so, then everybody would want to touch him. Bande Sri यो मे दर्शयदीशम भांतम भांतम अतीत्या कथया निजया कलुषम हरता करुना निधिनारु नशेलजुषा भगवाहन भाषित तत विदा ब्रिशवाहन मौन रहस्य भिता गनरान मुख सूरि सभा गुरुना गुन संचय रत्न महोद धिना धन गूढ सहस्र करेन यथा तनु कंचुक गुप तमहा महसा चतुरे न चलेंद्रिय निग्रहने बटुना पर I grew up in Bhagavan's hometown, Tiruchuri. My father-in-law was a revenue inspector and Bhagavan's father was a lawyer. I lived in Tiruchuri 
for three years when his father was alive. I was married when I was 13 years old and lived at my in-laws place for two years. When I was 15, my husband passed away. I then came to Thiruchuri and stayed at home all the time. It was at the age of 28 that I came to Bhagavan. I had not seen him before. My sister was married to a doctor, son of Thiruchuri's Lakshmi Amar. In those days, my brother-in-law and my sister's mother-in-law used to say, that a boy who used to live in Tiruchuri had become a great saint and now lives in Tiruvannamalai. They wanted me to see him. I refused, saying that it was not proper for me to leave home. Finally, they persuaded me to come here in 1928. When I came here, the old hall was already built and Dandapani Swami, Murganar's father-in-law, was in charge. He used to run a coffee shop earlier. Seeing me, he introduced me to Bhagavan as a relative Sammandi of Lakshmi Amar. Bhagavan gave a happy smile and said, Varatom, Varatom. She is welcome, she is welcome. I had come with a return ticket, which was valid for 15 days. I stayed for 15 days. When I took leave of Bhagwan, he handed me a copy of Who Am I? While I was here, I had my periods, so I had to be away for three days. Tenamma, the kitchen help, was preparing special food for me. She was grinding the chutney when Bhagwan came into the dining hall and seeing that asked Tenamma what she was doing. When she informed Bhagwan that due to the pollution of my periods, she was serving me yachamma's rice and the chutney outdoors. Bhagwan was annoyed and said, there is no pollution, give her ashram food. Why do you segregate her like this? My next visit was only after a year, and that also happened in a beautiful way. It seems the ashram was contemplating writing a letter to me, asking me to come and help in the kitchen. At that time, Sri Seshayar, a lawyer from Kakinada, and a father of six sons and a daughter visited my village to meet his relatives. He was going to Thiruvannamalai and asked me to go with him. The moment I entered the hall, Bhagavan remarked, See, you wanted to write to her and she has already arrived. Bhagavan and I used to cut vegetables, make paste and make other preparations for cooking. Even for dosa, we used to grind together. It was a great joy to work along with Bhagavan. He was always in a joyful mood. Even a few words spoken by Bhagavan or a stay of few minutes with him used to take away whatever sorrowful or dejected mood we were in. In those days, there was water scarcity for six months. So cooking was a difficult task during those six months of scarcity. We used to fetch water from the well in Palakotu and fill up a big vessel in the kitchen. Later, Bhagwan then had his well dug outside the dining hall, after which there was no water scarcity. I worked in the kitchen for five years. Santamma, Tenamma and Subalakshmi Amma used to work with me. Bhagawan would come with other sadhus to cut vegetables at five o'clock or so. We did all the three meals of the day, breakfast, lunch and dinner. The food was all prepared by me and I also had to serve Bhagawan. He liked it very much and insisted that I should serve him. Bhagawan's way of cooking was always very delightful. One day, he asked me to cook the brinjal, eggplant tops 
that had been left over along with some green peas. I argued that the tops were too thick and would not cook properly. He convinced me that I should cook it and told me that it would turn out all right. When it did not cook well, I went to the hall once or twice to tell him that it was still not cooked. Bhagwan then came and started stirring it. Surprisingly, it was cooked nicely. Keeping up the world, you can you have, what you are entering this office uh, ashram premises was the gate itself. You put uh, some sort of peace that anybody can enjoy that, but even not a devotee, that that is always here. So his presence is uh, felt here always. The jnani has no going or coming; he is always present. So uh, that is the case. There is no way to do the physical form is not necessary unless you are developed. Really to understand what is Bhagavan. Then only it is, it is, it is, even after coming here and sitting in the hall for months together, I was not able to understand Bhagavan. What is Bhagavan? What is he? What is he giving? What is he doing? Who is he? After some months only, I went to know what is Bhagavan. It is the supreme being, flesh and blood, perfection to the core. We cannot say. They say avatars. But he is not an avatar, just above that state. He is the supreme being, personified embodiment, face to face we sat among us, slept along with him, took our food with him, and sat with him at his feet for a verse together. And they say, we say, can you, Vedic age, we say, we hear about Rishis, the annals of history. We do not hear anything about such a great sage. He is the greatest sage of our time. In the, in the Vedic age also, there were rishis. They have got their own impulses. They get anger. They get lust, everything. But can we say anything about our Bhagavan? No, we can't say. And also, Mr. Chadwick told, is there, if at all there is anybody to, fit to express the greatness of Bhagavan, it is Bhagavan himself. What, will Bhagavan do that? No. That is the way that is the greatness of this Bhagavan. His bewitching smile, his beaming forehead, his glittering radiant eyes, his sweet voice with measured words, his sweet form, majestic form, can it still be seen in our ears. There is nothing felt because his physical form is absent, we do not feel any difference. Still, this power is more potent and more powerful and always here. Om Mahasena Mahom Shena Jataya Namaha Om Shri Ramanaya Namaha Om Gurave Namaha Om Akhanda Samvidakaraya Namaha Om Mahaujase Namaha Om Karanodbhavaya Namaha Om Jagat Dhitavataraya Namaha There was a lame puppy in the ashram, small and black. It would eat anything that was offered. Anantanarayan Rao, a devotee and a veterinarian, was asked by Bhagavan to take care of this puppy. 
In the morning, this puppy would be given idlis for breakfast. It would then relieve itself in front of the ashram office and create a nuisance for people there. When I was informed of this, I was angry at the dog and instructed the kitchen staff not to give him idlis. The dog ran to Bhagwan and complained, its tail wagging. When I told Bhagwan that the dog was denied idlis in accordance with my instructions, Bhagwan was annoyed and said, Oh ho, you're using your power. So many people have used power and have become power mad. Now it's your turn. The next morning, while Bhagwan sat for breakfast, he refused to take idlis and relented only when all of us prostrated before him, begging him to have his breakfast and promising that the puppy would be fed every day. That puppy used to eat even human waste and then come to Bhagwan. He would take his towel and wipe its face and keep the towel under his armpit, which won't be clean till the next morning. When we showed our displeasure, Bhagwan retorted, Yes, yes, you all pretend to be clean. Only the outside is clean. Is the inside clean? When he said that, we felt very ashamed. I listened to a sadhu lecture on Jnana Vasishta and about the samadhi state, but he himself was never in samadhi. I wondered if it was all just mere talk and theory and whether there existed someone who was actually in the state of samadhi. When I put this question to the sadhu, he told me not to have any doubts and that there was a jnani right then in Thiruvannamalai who had attained the realization at the age of 16. He hadn't read any Vedantic texts, but was a Mahanyani who had attained the highest state and was always in Samadhi. The sadhu mentioned that he has had Bhagwan's darshan. The moment I heard this, I was thrilled. The name Ramana Maharshi felt like nectar in my ears. Tears welled up in my eyes and my whole body quivered with joy. The urge to go see him welled up in me. In a few days, I set forth to Thiruvannamalai. Bhagwan was living in Skandashramam then. I was overjoyed to see the Sadhguru. I narrated all that had happened in Malayalam, the only language I knew then, and it was a boon for me that Bhagwan could follow and converse in that language fluently. I told Bhagwan that I had stopped doing japa and that I had not experienced samadhi as described in the Vedantic scriptures and was very confused. I prayed to him for peace of mind. After patiently hearing me out, Bhagavan quoted a verse from Kaivalya Navanitam which says, If you realize who you are, there is no cause for sorrow. I did not know what was meant by know who you are. Seeing me blinking in ignorance, Bhagavan proceeded to tell me that the mind is mere thoughts and knowing oneself is to find the source of all thoughts. So saying, he pointed to his heart. Until then, I was concentrating only on the Bhumadhyā. However, when I turned my attention to the heart, I was led to Samadhi quickly. It was like a flash of lightning and I lost body consciousness. I realized that Bhagavan had given me the Samadhi experience. 
He was looking at me all along. I was looking into his eyes when I went into Samadhi. It was then time for lunch. After lunch also I came to Bhagavan's presence. Then by a single look, Bhagavan put me into Samadhi again. Thenceforth, I would immerse myself in that blissful state again and again, oblivious of the body. In fact, I occasionally used to touch myself to check whether I had a body or not. I spent a happy 18 days like this at Skandashramam. Someone used to offer food to Bhagavan from which all of us were also given a share. I started feeling guilty that instead of offering food to the Guru, we were eating out of a share and that this was not proper. Also at home, I had my own room where I could practice in peace as I felt I was established in Samadhi. I felt I could remain in Samadhi all day at home. Besides, this would absolve me of the sin of causing my guru loss of food. I went back to my village, but as the time passed, the intensity of meditation lessened. When I noticed that I could no longer be in Samadhi, I understood that the Samadhi Anubhava is by the grace of the guru and not by my own attainment. I felt that I shouldn't have come away from Bhagavan and that had Bhagavan used the same logic, he would have gone back to Tirichuli. When I returned to Skandashram, Perumal Swami was attending to Bhagavan's personal needs, like bringing hot water for him and so forth. Perumal Swami taught me how to look after Bhagavan's needs and entrusted me with that job, as he had to leave for the nearby Kovilur Mat to attend some festivities. While I was attending on Bhagavan, I told him how the intensity of Samadhi had lessened once in my village. Bhagavan very graciously quoted from Kaivalya Navanitam that the Samadhi Anubhava occurs to everyone and anyone by the mere presence of the Sadhguru or by reading his works, but it would not be permanent. Bhagavan further explained that the state of sthita prajna has to be attained by Shravana, Manana and Nididhyasana. Again, he quoted from Kaivalya Navanitam where it is said that just as one would dig the ground, plant a pole and pack the dirt back in order to secure the pole, one must practice incessantly in order to make the experience of Samadhi permanent. Again quoting Kaivalya Navanitam, he said that as long as the duality of the knower and known remains, one must practice. These words of Bhagavan cleared my doubts and I have been with him ever since, serving him and following his instructions by his grace. These trees I am making, what I was living here. What do you think matter whether I live here or there? The practice, you practice. Who am I? Who am I? Not where am I or when am I? Who am I? 
leave the other things alone, confuse yourself with the other questions and see who you are. Where you are not in sleep, now you have come. Where from you have come, you can see. It's a clue. It's the only way. Bhavan also has said that it has been somewhere. So you believe in Bhagavan, have absolute faith in Bhagavan and try to practice this whole me. Mind will be easily. You, that is whether there is no whether is a mind or no mind, it is material. But mind is you realize, you understand what you are, what my mind is, everything will be clear then. You concentrate you if you want to understand a thing. You focus, you concentrate the same thing introspectively. Introspectively, but it's not in the, the, the. You concentrate in the brain. Introspection goes to the heart. That's the difference. It goes directly to the heart. Because I is from the heart. From my days. Oh Everything ends in I, according to all our, our literature, your philosophy, your this, everything, all I, I know this. Radha Krishna, yes, I, whoever it is. But the Jnani is beyond I. So I don't want to presume or assume I am Jnani, but I know some, what I am telling you, if you agree, if it is please you. It is very simple. You must know the method, the technique of it, so to say. It's a technique, no doubt. Because you know words. It's a, as, I, as I told you, it's nearly trying to remember a forgotten thing. You must focus. Yes, I know. You say like that, but here, Ah, who am I, Bhagavan? I was not in sleep. Where were I in sleep? Where from now I have come? Where from you have you come now? In sleep you are not. Can you tell me the place where you were in sleep? No. But if you focus, if you have attention, there is a revolution. You understand. But you will take some time. No thoughts, no dream. Waking is only daydream. Because you have changed so many of your ideas about things, your opinion or ideas about men and things. What does it mean? If it is, if it is real, it must be permanent. But you have changed it from your birth or your from majority, you have attained your major, major uh, version. After that you have changed many views, many opinions, many thoughts. Therefore, this nothing is permanent. But you are permanent. You are in sleep also because you know the experience of sleep. It was pleasant. It was happy. You are still the same. But you must think this. Try. If at first you don't succeed, try it, try again. Don't give it up. But you will get it, Bhagavan's grace, and this anomaly. You know, don't think it's an ordinary rock or a hill. It is an omnipotent. It, is, it has dragged Bhagavan here, so to say, for our benefit. Prasarata dita shubha vilokitam Ramanate sakri thalatu me kritam Ramanajan mina mai bhavan guru Abhida ashaya stava mahanuru Jagada hampara spurati me trayam Sadabhidam gira tava visam shayam Padupadeshato galati samvida Mai niranyaya sadaha morbhida Ahami ontara stamamalam hridi Anubhave mabho stavakripayadi
he was a being whose advent into this world would bless the earth goddess. And there is a line in Sanskrit in Bhagavata which says, Dhanya Bhagavati Yukshoni Mahatam Padachinita. They put their feet on the earth. Earth feels blessed. To my mind, he was one of the most glorious beings that have ever visited this earth. The more you live with him, the more you feel that you have done something in the past something great which entitled you to deserve association with Baba. Being with Him is being elevated. You need not talk with Him. You need not discuss with Him. You need not try to learn from Him through speech. He was pouring out His grace like the rays of the sun. No stopping ever. It was for you to receive. You must have the proper receptivity. Of course we could not do it all the time, <laughs> being weak. Whatever we could receive, we could observe. went into us without our knowing it and remade us. There was no special effort needed on our part. It was all His. The effort was not really ours. Of course He had no effort, to, He had no need of any effort to make. But he was molding us, he was shaping us. If only who did not put any psychological obstruction between himself and us, like doubting, like mental distraction on our part. Without my effort, Bhagavan's figure comes before my mind. Off and on, sometimes mm, intensely. So there is no need for me to uh, revive my memory, as it were, by an effort. It is as if he has occupied my being. That is what Bhagavan would do to anyone. Though I did, we are utterly sincere. Insincerity would not pay in regard to Bhagavan, however great a person might be. Once he knows you are sincere, you get everything from Bhagavan. Even now, I do feel he will answer your call, provided it is really sincere. He is here near you, wherever you be, in the heart it is, as the Self.